The Oceanic White Tip is a requiem shark found in tropical and warm seas. Despite its large size and broad distribution, the species has not been as heavily researched as many other sharks. Although the number of confirmed attacks on humans by the white tip is low, the species has been popularised in human culture as an aggressive and fearsome predator, known alternatively as the shipwreck shark. But does this reputation hold true to the real life species, or is it just a pirate's tall tale? To find out, I spoke to Dr. John Carlson, research biologist at the National Marine Fisheries Service in Florida, and Dr. Eric Kluwer, professor of marine biology at the École Pratique des Hautes Études in Paris. We'll be hearing from them throughout the video, but first, let's have a look at this species classification. The oceanic white tip was described by Cuban zoologist Felipe Poe in 1861. It was given the Latin name Carcharhinus longimanus, with longimanus translating to long hands, in reference to the species' broad pectoral fins. As a member of the Carcharhinidae family, oceanic white tips are classified as a requiem shark. Requiem sharks generally are your more common variety of sharks, if, if you want to put it that way. They, they are a group of sharks that doesn't have a lot of you know, diversity in terms of body forms like the hammerheads, the horn sharks. Um, so, so requiem shark is everyone kind of thinks of it as, as your regular shark. It's what most people get in their mind. Requiem sharks are notable for being implicated in a large proportion of shark attacks on humans. With the exception of the great white, which belongs to the Lamnidae family, essentially all sharks that attack humans to a significant level belong to this one group. However, due to how visually homogenous they are, identifying individual species involved in attacks is difficult, and has led to some inaccuracy in records. A total of 60 species fall under this grouping, including some of the best recognised sharks. Tiger, bull, grey reef, lemon, and blue sharks may all be found here, although oceanic white tips are distinguished somewhat by the titular white tip markings on the ends of their fins. The other defining characteristic of oceanic white tips are their long pectoral and dorsal fins. These fins are significantly larger than most other shark species, and have a unique shape when compared to other requiem sharks. While species like tiger sharks have triangular and pointed fins, the fins of the oceanic white tip are visibly rounded. When you look at the oceanic white tip, they have these very broad pectoral fins, which is just analogous to like a wings on a plane, which allows them to glide through the water probably with, with less energy than say a coastal shark, which might have more retracted fins, fins along the side of its body that are not designed for swimming in the open ocean over long distances. Open ocean predators often have to travel greater distances to find prey, which demands a form more suited to that environment. Blue sharks are another example of this, with exaggerated proportions that allow that species to migrate from New England in the United States all the way to South Africa. While oceanic white tips generally have a more typical form for a requiem shark, both species have somewhat flattened bodies, potentially as a result of streamlining. While it's only medium sized for a requiem shark, oceanic white tips are one of the largest shark species generally. Of the 400 or so sharks, oceanic white tips rank 23rd, with the largest specimen ever caught measuring 4 metres from nose to tail. This is considered exceptionally long, however, as it's rare for specimens to exceed a length of even 3 metres. Lastly, the species' jaws are lined with up to 30 teeth, between 13 and 15 on the lower jaw, and 14 or 15 on the upper jaw. The lower jaw teeth are pointed with thin, serrated tips, while the upper jaw's teeth are much larger, with entirely serrated edges. This allows a species to pierce and hold its prey from its lower jaw, while the triangular teeth on its upper jaw tear them apart. So from my research, there isn't much information out there about the species' anatomy or behaviour. Um, why is this and what can you tell me about it? Well, actually, the, the uh, one specificity of that, that uh, species of sharks is that what we call an epipelagic. So um, epipelagic means, first of all, that it, it, it lives in the, in, the, in the pelagic environment. And, you know, pelagic comes from pelagios, which means high sea. So these sharks, to make it clear, they, they live very far from humans. You know, they, they live in the high seas. And epi means above, you know. So actually, it means that they, they remain uh, quite close to the surface 
okay? But the, the, the main point is to understand that they, they, they are very difficult to see because, you know, they, they're very uh, far from, from the coast. And that could explain the, the lack of knowledge, you know, of, of that species because, of course, it's much easier for people to uh, understand, to know, to study sharks that are living closer to them. An important thing to recognise when it comes to the pelagic zone is that compared to more coastal marine habitats, it is ecologically barren. The oceanic white tip often has to cover vast stretches of water to scan for possible food sources, which demands slow movement to maintain the species' energy. Being an epipelagic species, oceanic white tips spend much of their time between the surface of the water and 200 metres deep. Marine life is heavily concentrated in this zone, including the species the white tip predates upon. While it mainly eats bony fish like barracuda, marlin and mackerel, and cephalopods like squid and octopus, its diet can be quite varied. The species has been known to hunt thread fins, stingrays and sea turtles, among many others. But while oceanic white tips seem to prefer this upper level of the water column, there's evidence to suggest they're able to dive much deeper. In 2019, an individual filmed off the Kona coast in Hawaii was scarred with golf ball sized suction marks on its skin, indicating the shark had survived a battle with a giant squid. Giant squid are bathopelagic, a level of the deep ocean that is pitch black save for the occasional bioluminescent organism. This is the first evidence of any shark interacting with a giant squid, which live at depths exceeding 1,000 metres. Up until the 16th century, sharks were largely known to European mariners as sea dogs. It's likely this term comes from oceanic white tips, the most common ship following shark. Mariners would have likely seen it more often than some other species, thanks to its broad range and inquisitive nature. In particular, white tips exhibit quite dog-like behaviour when their interest is piqued. One thing I can tell you about the oceanic white tip sharks is they are very curious sharks. Um, some of the research that we've actually done indirectly in the Bahamas, you, you had, we have floats that were hanging behind the back of the boat. And a lot of times you'll just see the shark with a poke at it. And in, in particular, some colors, they seem to be more interested in others, like yellow and orange. And they'll come up and they'll mouth it and they'll poke at it. So they are, seem to be a generally very curious shark. While not far swimmers, oceanic white tips can move in quite unpredictable ways. They're capable of surprising bursts of speed, which allows them to compete for food with silky sharks. Their swimming style is generally characterized by leisurely movements, but punctuated with aggressive displays. However, this kind of behavior has undeniably hurt the species' reputation in human culture. They don't feed like a white shark where the white will circle, circle, and make a you know a mad sh shot for the surface, or the mad shot at their prey. I mean, you've seen the air jaws, you know, when they're knocking seals out of the water and stuff. So with a oceanic white tip, they'll circle it. I've been in the water with them and they kind of circle you, they get a little closer, they get curious, they'll kind of come up and we've had them bounce off the cameras. So they, that kind of may have been interpreted early on as an aggressive species. The white tip shark with a record of unprovoked attacks on human beings. Even for the experienced diver, there's danger. The more aggressive tendencies of this species have not gone unnoticed in human depictions. American novelist Ernest Hemingway portrayed them as aggressive opportunists in The Old Man in the Sea. French oceanographer Jacques Cousteau would go on to describe the oceanic white tip as the most dangerous of all sharks in his 1970 book The Shark, Splendid Savage of the Sea. This is despite the fact that the oceanic white tip only has 15 confirmed attacks on humans to its name. When compared to the 142 attacks from tiger sharks, or the staggering 351 from great whites, it's easy to conclude that this species isn't really that threatening. In reality, the reason for these relatively low numbers is all down to the species' isolation from humans. I think it's a shark which is very, very dangerous for, 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 for people. So if you get me right, um, is, the, is the fact that the ecology of that shark doesn't allow it to be in close contact with humans often. And that's the only way to explain why there is so few bites actually on, on people by, by this species of shark, which is, which is uh, dangerous. But while coastal attacks from the oceanic white tip are exceedingly rare, the species isn't known as the shipwreck shark for no reason. It's suspected it may be responsible for many fatal bites when predating on survivors of shipwrecks or downed aircraft, one of the few cases where people find themselves in open ocean waters. Let's wind the clock back a little bit to World War II. Having just completed a top secret delivery of uranium and other components for Little Boy, the nuclear bomb that would later be dropped on Hiroshima, the USS Indianapolis departed the Tinian naval base. Four days later, on the 30th of July 1945, she was torpedoed by a Japanese submarine and sank over the following 12 minutes. 
Of the 1,195 crewmen, 300 went down with the ship. It took three and a half days for the Navy to begin rescuing survivors, and during this time, the majority of the crew died. Most reportedly succumbed to the elements, but according to survivor accounts, potentially hundreds of the Indianapolis crew were killed by sharks, with the oceanic white tip believed to have been responsible for most, if not all, of these attacks. A similar case happened a few years earlier in 1942, where the RMS Nova Scotia was sunk by a German submarine off the coast of South Africa. The Laconia order issued by Grand Admiral Karl Dunitz just two months prior barred German vessels from saving survivors of sunken ships, a decision which led him to being indicted for war crimes during the Nuremberg trials. Are we the baddies? A shocking 858 people died, the majority of whom were Italian civilian internees. Because the crew of the Nova Scotia only managed to launch one lifeboat for sinking, those who were left in the water drowned. But like the USS Indianapolis, survivor accounts suggest that shark attacks were the leading cause of death. If these accounts are accurate, the sinking of the USS Indianapolis and the RMS Nova Scotia were easily the deadliest shark attacks in history. If we could somehow confirm that the oceanic white tip was responsible, the species would surpass all other sharks in number of attacks on humans. And these are just recent examples. Potentially hundreds or thousands more could have been killed by the species in shipwrecks throughout history. Do you think the species Correct. is quite as dangerous as those accounts suggest? No, I don't, I don't think so. I mean, I, again, it's, it's one of these where the sharks may have been acting to an opportunity where there was other, you know, sharks with them. So people may have thought that all sharks were oceanic white tips. So, you know, just from my personal experience, you know, I've been in the water with them. And, you know, as I said, they, they get very curious. They have definitely been implicated in some attacks. And one of the interesting things is I told you about the colors, you know, life jackets, what color are life jackets? Red or yellow or bright colors. And that seems to attract them for whatever reason. So a lot of times they may have been going up to mouth the uh, the life jacket when they accidentally bit the bit the person or the sailor in the in the life jacket. The oceanic white tip is found globally in deep open oceans. It prefers waters between 20 and 28 degrees Celsius, but exceptionally it can occur in environments as cold as 15 degrees Celsius. This kind of adaptability gives a species a broad range, and the white tip can be found in a wide band around the globe. While we don't have any accurate data on the current population of the species, it was historically one of the most abundant sharks in tropical seas worldwide. In their 1970 book, The Natural History of Sharks, Thomas Linear Weaver and Richard Backus wrote that the oceanic white tip was extraordinarily abundant, perhaps the most abundant large animal on the face of the earth. But today, the IUCN Red List estimates that the species population has declined by around 98%, with a high probability that 80% of that loss occurred over just three generations, or the last 61 years. In 2000, the species was given the conservation status of near threatened. In 2006, that was moved to vulnerable. As of the IUCN's most recent assessment in 2019, the oceanic white tip is considered critically endangered. So how can a species go from being so abundant to being on the brink of extinction in such a short period? In the case of the white tip, industrial fishing is to blame. When you want to fish, you know, a tuna or a billfish, you just put a bait which is a squid on a, on a hook. And, and unfortunately, you know, the squid is also a prey of the shark. So we call that, we call that bycatch. Uh, because it doesn't target really the shark. But the problem is that bycatch can be really fast, you know, overcatch and overfishing. Why? Because sharks are much more vulnerable to what fishing that uh, other species that are cons that should be considered as prey. You know, the prey, they, they, they recover, they, they reproduce much, much, much more uh, efficiently than, than predators. Fishing them, you or you very quickly overfish them. You know, so overfishing is definitely the big problem for for sharks in general and for the oceanic white tip in particular, based on the fact that there is a very uh, intense, you know, uh, fishing, uh, as I said, of high-value fish like tunas and and billfish in the open sea which is also, unfortunately, the habitat, uh, preferred habitat of, of the oceanic white tip sharks. Despite the fact that they are prohibited from retention in all the major regional fishery management organizations, um, ICAT, IATTC, WCPSC, they all have retention bans. They are still caught as bycatch. Unfortunately, we do still see the fins in the black market. There was a bust two years ago in Vancouver where there was just a case full of oceanic white tip fins. While white tips are not often targeted by fisheries, 
Their open ocean habitat puts them in closer contact than most shark species. The white tip's inquisitive nature means it often gets caught in nets and is retained to sell its skin, meat, liver oil, and particularly its fins. The species' large fins we were talking about earlier make it a bigger target, as they are highly valued as the main ingredient in shark fin soup, a Chinese delicacy served in parts of Asia. Obviously, oceanic white tips are an integral part of the ocean, but just like everything is an integral part of the ocean, it would just be a sad case if we had such a unique, fascinating animal that by all historic accounts was probably one of the most abundant pelagic species um, in the oceans disappear from that ecosystem. While we are still um, uh, uh, buying in supermarkets tuna fish, billfish, whatever, without knowing at which cost, you know, these fish were, were caught, you know, we will maintain the system because once, you know, these industrial fishers, they can sell the product. They will make money while they make money. They're not interested about stopping the activity. You know, that is how it works. If I go to the supermarket and I buy tuna, I make sure that on the tuna can or, or whatever the, the product I buy, I make sure it comes from sustainable, but a real sustainable uh, uh, process, you know, and it must be artisanal fishing. If it is artisanal fishing, you can make sure that the impact on the, on the, on the ecosystem would be much lower than industrial fishing. I don't know any, I don't know, I'm clear about that. I don't know any industrial fishing that is sustainable because industrial fishing, it's too, too efficient. You know what I mean? You kill too many fish. The good ones, if I can say so, like meaning, for example, the tunas and the bad ones, which are in this case, the sharks. So the, the, the real story starts uh, with you as a consumer. We're trying to raise the awareness of the species right now. A lot of people don't even know that they are listed as the Endangered Species Act and that they're um, um, listed as a prohibited species or critical, critically endangered status. So what we're trying to do is raise that status and awareness, you know, similar to the great whales. Most people all know that the great whales have suffered huge declines because of whaling. I would argue in some cases that the oceanic white tips decline is greater than some of the great whales decline. There's still a lot of great interest in um, diving with oceanic white tip sharks. That's one way of potentially increasing their, their visibility. There are um, dive operations in the Red Sea, there are dive operations in the Bahamas, there are dive operations in Kona, but we still would ask that when people are in the water, they exercise some caution, listen to their dive masters, because as I said, they do get curious and they have on occasion bitten someone by mistake. So we ask that you enjoy the, the, the being in the ocean with these animals, but also respect their environment and give them the proper distance that they need. Thank you for watching. While the oceanic white tip doesn't have the same kind of fame as other shark species, it's just as, if not more threatened than many of them. My next video won't be on animal, but it's a really interesting topic that I haven't seen much coverage of. Oh, and in case you're wondering, the game footage that's been on screen throughout the video is Abzu. It's really good and you should play it. Okay, that's it from me, have a good one.